Grace and peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So often we approach the Bible as if it were just a cold theological treatise. That it's just theological stuff to fill our heads with and there's no real story to it. Part of this is probably because we do have a very high regard for Scripture, right? It is the divinely inspired, inerrant Word of God. But sometimes when we approach it that way, we miss the warmth and heart and loveliness of Scripture. For instance, we begin today a four-week look at the book of Philippians. Now, this is a book I've read a number of times, and... Uh, I'm familiar with the themes that are throughout it. Joy, righteousness, faith, uh, God getting us through those hard times. But for whatever reason, I had actually never made the connection of this book with one of my absolute favorite parts of the book of Acts. In the book of Acts, we find Paul on his second missionary journey. This time, Paul has decided, I'm going to Asia Minor. I'm going to go preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to a people who have never heard it. And so he sets out. He's ready to go into Asia Minor. And verse 5 of chapter 16 says that the Holy Spirit had forbidden it. (laughs) The Holy Spirit wouldn't allow him to do it. So he changes his plan. He says, fine, I'm going to go north. I'm going to go to another area where they haven't yet heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm going north. And verse 7 says, the spirit of Jesus did not allow them. (laughs) This seems strange, doesn't it? What does Paul want to do? He wants to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to people who haven't yet heard it. That's good. That's according to God's revealed will, isn't it? But the Holy Spirit wouldn't allow him. Jesus himself wouldn't allow him. And so sometimes we have a plan in our mind of what we're going to do, and it's even according to God's revealed will, and God closes that door, doesn't allow it to happen, redirects us because he wants us to do something else. Well, one night Paul receives a vision of a Macedonian man standing and urging him Come over to Macedonia and help us. Now, Paul knew that this was a Macedonian man. We're not quite sure how Paul knew it was a Macedonian man. But remember, Alexander the Great was from Macedonia. And the city that Paul goes to, Philippi, had been founded as a colony for retired Roman soldiers. So it seems to me quite likely that this Macedonian man was standing there in military garb and saying, come over to us and help us. That's speculation on my part, but maybe. Whatever the case, Paul left immediately for Macedonia. And you can imagine his excitement. Here he goes, all right, we're going to Macedonia. We've been called there. And this is a city of retired Roman soldiers. Maybe what God's going to do here is he's going to give us now an army for the Lord, right? An an army of men who are going to hear the gospel. They're going to then go out into the world with the gospel, and God's going to do amazing things. Well, upon arrival in Philippi, Paul discovers that there's not even a synagogue in the city. Now, synagogue is one of those words that we hear in the Bible, but we might not really understand what it's all about. Synagogues were established when the Jewish diaspora happened, when the uh, the Jewish people were, were dispersed through the Roman world. And so they're, they're spread out, and they're not by the temple. And so they set up these synagogues, which were places to come and learn the scriptures, to be instructed in the word of God. They weren't temples. You didn't offer sacrifices there. You had the scrolls of God's word. You would hear them read and then hear them taught. Well, to have a synagogue, you had to have ten men who were the head of their household. There wasn't a synagogue in Philippi. What's that tell you? There weren't ten godly men in the whole city. So instead, 
Paul goes outside of the city. He finds a group of women who have gathered on the Old Testament Sabbath on Saturday by the river in order to pray, and he begins to talk to them about Jesus. He begins to proclaim the good news of Jesus to them. And soon a woman named Lydia heard the message. Uh, rather than me telling the story, let me read how Luke tells this in the book of Acts. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul, and after she was baptized and her household as well, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. <laughs> so Paul goes to Philippi, and he doesn't see men become the new leaders that he's anticipated, what does he see? A group of women. And this woman, Lydia, becomes one of the greatest encouragers, the greatest supporters of Paul and the ministry that he will ever have. He didn't see it coming, <laughs> but the Lord did. Now, the next thing that we hear about that, that happens in, you know, following this, this account is there's a slave girl who is possessed by a demon, and this demon-possessed slave girl is able to tell fortunes. So the slave owners see her as, well, as a way of getting money from people. People would come to them, pay money, she would tell the fortune, and it was a pretty good business deal for them. They didn't really care about her. Well, this girl starts following Paul and Silas around and crying out, These men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. Day after day after day, this girl is doing this. And finally, Paul turns to her and she says, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And the demon leaves her immediately. Now, this greatly annoyed the slave owners. Why? Well, <laughs> Paul... You just killed the goose that lays the golden eggs. You've just taken away our business. I don't care that you helped this girl and got rid of that demon. You took away our income. <laughs> so they grab Paul, they grab Silas, they drag them into the market in front of the, uh, the magistrates, the rulers of that area, and they start bringing trumped up charges against Paul and Silas. And they get the whole crowd to turn against Paul and Silas. And here's what it says in verse 22. The crowd joined in attacking them. And the magistrates tore the garments off them and gave, them, gave orders to beat them with rods. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. You couldn't blame Paul if he were kind of irritated at this point, could you? <laughs> he first got, wants to go to Asia Minor. He's not allowed by God. Wants to go north. He's not allowed by God. Finally, he goes to Philippi, and he doesn't find this army of men. He finds a group of women... And then when he helps the slave girl, his reward is he gets beaten with rods and thrown into prison. <laughs> you couldn't blame him if he were a little bit angry about this. But I love what happens next. Listen to this. Verse 25. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. <laughs> They're praying and praising God. Amazing. How could they have such an attitude? Well, Paul knew what it was he had been set free from. He knew what Jesus had done for him. He knew even as he was in prison there, he was actually free in Jesus. So now, what happens next is also just fantastic there's an earthquake. God sends an earthquake. And this earthquake opens up all of the prison doors. All of the shackles are loosened. And the jailer comes out. He sees the prison doors are all opened. He panics. He thinks all of the prisoners have escaped. And he's ready to kill himself. Why? Well, 
Because either the prisoners might find him, and they would probably try to kill him, he thinks, or worse, if the prisoners don't find him and kill him, he's going to face Roman justice. And that would be horrific, because he would have to answer for all of those escaped prisoners. So right about the time he's about to harm himself, Paul calls out, don't harm yourself, we're all here. The jailer can't believe it, but it's true. They're all present and accounted for. And so now, at this point, the, the, prisoner, or the jailer has heard Paul and Silas talk about Jesus, pray to Jesus, sing about Jesus. And so he now says, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. They taught him about Jesus. They baptized him and his whole family that night. And all of this took place in the city of Philippi, the very place where Paul's sending this letter. So now it's years later, and Paul is in prison again. At the time of writing this letter, he's in prison again, this time in Rome. And his dear friends, his church family in Philippi, have heard about Paul's imprisonment. Lydia and the jailer would have been part of that congregation. Maybe that slave girl was too. They'd been blessed by Paul and his ministry, and so now they say, we our, our friend Paul is in prison. What can we do? Let's take up a collection. They take up a collection, and they send one of their members with this collection to bring it to Paul to help him in his time of need. And so the, the book of Philippians is this wonderful thank you letter to the Philippian congregation. It's Paul writing to his dear friends who have now helped him out and who have encouraged him, and now he wants to return the favor and encourage them. Now, hopefully all of this background helps us to better understand this wonderful little letter. So when Paul writes from prison, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. You can just imagine that, that former you know, that jailer in, in Philippi hearing Paul talk about, oh, he's in prison again. <laughs> you know what? Those guys don't stand a chance. He's going to be telling them about Jesus nonstop. They're going to be hearing about the gospel all the time. They think they have him captive. He's got a captive audience. The Roman soldiers can't leave. They have to guard him. So he's going to tell them all about Jesus. This, this former, former jailer, or the, 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 the man who had jailed Paul and had come to faith is now hearing about, oh, he's in jail again. You know what Paul's going to do. He's going to be telling the gospel to all of these jailers, and they're going to be hearing about Jesus. And when Paul writes that he fully expects that all of this will turn out for his deliverance, he then tells them, you see, this is going to happen one of two ways. Either I'm going to die, and that's going to be great, because I get to be with the Lord, and the resurrection awaits, or <laughs> I'm going to be delivered out of this jail, just as happened in Philippi. See, after he had been beaten, and jailed. The next morning, the magistrates send word to the jailer, you know, send him out, let him go free. But Paul says, no, -uh, that's not how this is happening. Listen to this. But Paul said to them, they have beaten us publicly, uncondemned men who were Roman soldier, citizens, and have thrown us into prison. And do they now throw us out secretly? No. Let them come themselves and take us out. The police reported these words to the magistrates, and they were afraid when they heard that they were Roman citizens. And they came and apologized to them, and they took them out and asked them to leave the city. So they went out of the prison and visited Lydia, and when they had seen the brothers, they encouraged them and departed 
He gets sent into jail, but he gets set free in this just phenomenal way, right? These very, the same people who put him into prison now have to accompany him and basically apologize to him, and, and he walks out absolutely vindicated. He had been delivered, right? The Philippian congregation had seen how God can work. They had seen all of these circumstances happen. They had heard this message from Paul, and now Paul writes to them to encourage them as they've encouraged him. So there's a few things I want you to take away from this today. First is this. God's church It's just a wonderful gift. The people of God are such a blessing to each other. God has given us to one another to encourage each other, to pray for one another, and to help each other when things are difficult. That's exactly what the Philippian congregation did, isn't it? Oh, our friend Paul is in trouble. What can we do? Well, we're going to help. And Paul now writes to them, he's, I want to encourage you. So there's this mutual partnership, this benefit that each receive. And that's what God does for us with the people right around us right now. The other thing is this. Even the circumstances, even in the circumstances we would least expect it, God can and will advance the gospel. Here's Paul in prison. Oh, well, there's no hope of him going and telling anybody about Jesus. Oh, yeah? There's people that have to guard him. He's going to tell them all about Jesus. Oh, here's COVID-19. Well, we got to shut down things. Oh, well, oh, we have live stream services now because now everybody can hear the gospel in ways that maybe we should have been doing before, but we weren't doing, and God said, no, you're going to do it now, and people are going to hear the gospel, and we'll see what the Lord does with that. Even in those situations, we think, look, like there's nothing God can do with it. He's advancing the gospel. So Paul writes to his friends in Philippi. He's been encouraged. He encourages them, and he reminds them of all of the blessings we have in Christ and the reality that in the end, we have victory because of Jesus. Let's close today with a word of prayer. Lord Jesus, we thank you. You have given us to each other to be a support, to pray for each other, to walk with each other in good times and in bad. What a blessing the church is and that you allow us to be a part of that church. We thank you also that you are at work Even when we don't see how it's possible, you can still work good. You can still work for uh, the, the furtherance of the gospel. We pray that you would help us not to see the obstacles around us and think that things are hopeless, but to see the the challenges around us and to know that you are greater than those challenges and that you will work through us, through the church, through your word to bring about exactly what you intend. Give us that confidence that we would live with that boldness that we see in Paul and in so many others. In Jesus' name, amen. Now may the peace that passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus to life everlasting. Amen.